next speakers, uh, it's a double act, so this is very exciting. Um, and it's Troy Ellis and Aaron Gilson, and they're asking how far have we come at the AWL of South Australia? Troy Ellis is a long-standing team leader with over 20 years' experience in the animal welfare industry. He is both a dog and a cat specialist and a great problem solver. He enjoys teaching team members new skills and has been enjoying dabbling in the world of doggy playgroups when he's not managing the, managing the AWL's Edinburgh North Shelter. Troy shares his life with his wife, who also has over 25 years within the animal industry, his daughter, a Boston Terrier, hang on, there's a comma there, I think, um, two cats and a rabbit. Aaron Gilson is an extremely talented behavioural trainer. He holds a certificate for in companion animals behaviour through the Delta Society and runs his own dog training business. We're not working with the many animals that come into the care of the AWL on a daily basis. Aaron has been part of the AWL team for 12 years and is also currently studying under a scholarship with the Gene Donaldson Academy for Dog Trainers in San Francisco in the US. Aaron shares his life with a supportive partner who is also a dog trainer, his lovely daughter and special needs dog Luna. Welcome to the stage. Thank you, everyone. So just some background to begin with. Uh, the Animal Welfare League is a pound for several local councils, along with a rehoming centre for a number of others. Uh, South Australia doesn't have a holding period for cats. Instead, all councils direct all stray inquiries to the Animal Welfare League or RSPCA. Uh, we take all surrendered animals, regardless of health and temperament, and we adopt out all sorts of pets, from cats, dogs, rabbits, and the odd goat or two. The services we offer include pet boarding, emergency boarding, dog training classes, pet cremations, and grooming. So Troy and I are here today to talk about some of the strategies and changes that we have implemented since the last summer in 2015. Uh, these strategies include playgroups for our dogs, off-site adoptions, managed intake, and low-cost microchipping. Lastly, we'll also be discussing uh, the redevelopment of our shelter. In April of 2015, our Animal Welfare and Services Manager, Leanne, who is also here today, was fortunate enough to head over to the UK and attend the Association of Dogs and Cats Home Conference to gain an idea about where we sit within the animal industry in comparison to other parts of the world. Leanne also visited a few other animal shelters and rescue organisations while in the UK and found that we really are not alone with the issues that we face here in Australia. And just as we are, they are also dabbling in some of the US smart-driven sheltering strategies. Upon returning to Australia, Leanne then presented to staff what she had learnt whilst over there and a couple of ideas that we could look to implement. However, Leanne did find it difficult to maintain the enthusiasm because it was just her that had attended and it was therefore harder to get people on board in implementing some of these positive changes. Although this was a much different experience later in the year at G2Z where a number of staff also attended, and as a group, they were able to keep that enthusiasm and momentum going in pushing forward with the take-home strategies. So our take-home from the last G2Z Okay, that's not working, that's okay. Um, starting with adoptions, uh, remove obstacles, have conversations with people, and empower the person to be a good pet owner. Our adoption processes have improved by thanks, Troy, learning to trust the people that adopt from us, to make them feel comfortable to ask questions and to not feel judged. I guess that's something that you know, we've really you know, gone over the last couple of days as well. We don't want it to be some kind of interrogation, that we really want to move these animals as fast as possible. We want to set them up for success. We want to let them know that our support doesn't stop once the pet has left our care, whether it be a week after adoption or a year, we're always here for them. There's just something else that I'll just add in now as well. Um, so with one of our programs that we do after adoption, particularly with our more behavioural, chale behaviourally challenging dogs that we rehome, we do offer a follow-up. Uh, we offer free private consults and also dog training classes. It'd be interesting to hear what the rest of how the rest of people go with this, but we find that very rarely do people actually take us up on these offers. Um, you know, I rang eight clients last week and there was only three. So we do do a follow-up. It's not that they contact us. So yeah, it's just it's one of those things that, you know, do we assume that the dogs are doing well and we do ask these questions too? But it's, it's just something that we don't know. Is, is there something falling down in the line? So once again, yeah, I'd love to hear from you guys in relation to that. Um, 
Manage shelter intake saves money, saves time, saves lives. What can we do to keep animals out? Uh, looking at our surrender processes, we've implemented surrender by appointment. This enables us the chance to provide owners with assistance, preventing the animal coming into our care in the first place. So upon our first conversation with them, we, we can offer behavioural advice and training, emergency warning, food, etc., depending on their circumstances. And we found offering such help has helped reduce the amount of people that follow through with the appointment. We're still gonna get walk-ins. They account for around 25% of our surrenders, who of course we don't turn away. We've also modified our surrender forms a number of times and to we're happy that the information we're getting not only told us why the owner was surrendering the pet because we found that owners can sometimes either overstate or understate problems, but most importantly, that information can be used to help fast track that pet into the most appropriate home in the least amount of time. Fast tracking is another simple but great idea which we've had success with. Uh, previously, even with our surrender animals, we would not have begun the assessment for rehoming for at least 72 hours. However, pets can now be assessed both medically and behaviourally on arrival when appropriate and then placed up for adoption. Our quickest surrender to adopt, uh, wasn't as quick as what the speaker today mentioned, I think it was about 45 minutes, was 12 hours for an adult cat, but it's now not uncommon to have pets arrive and have all checks including vaccinations, dissexing, microchipping and be up for adoption within 48 hours. We've also started looking at our stray pets sooner, so if we are unable to locate the owner, we can have them up for adoption quicker, uh, just keeping in mind with our legislative requirements. All right, so this is one of my favourite things and person uh, things that I'm involved with the most. Uh, so Troy attended uh, Trish McMillan's workshop at the last G2Z, mm -hmm. highlighting the benefits of playgroups for shelter dogs. Uh, these benefits included finding out more about the dog's social skills, giving the dogs more confidence, helping reduce their stress levels, burning off their energy, and lastly, helping staff to get to know the dogs better, which in turn can obviously help inform possible adoptees. Uh, Katina's workshop was excellent. That really reinforced a lot of the things that um, we've also mentioned here. The skills learnt through these playgroups also helps uh, when owners bring in their resident dogs in to do a meet and greet with one of our adoption dogs. We've also used playgroups from some cases as a behaviour modification tool. Playgroup style is an area that not everyone feels comfortable uh, as it requires an ability to read dog behaviour quickly, confidently and to intervene if necessary. It's also, yeah, it's, it's not been easy to keep them going on a regular basis, uh, mainly due to staffing challenges. Over the years we have of course done more informal playgroups, however it was after Troy attended Trish's workshop that upon his return he began writing something up procedurally that could be replicated safely not only for the staff but most importantly for the animals involved in the playgroups. I'll now hand over to Troy who will discuss playgroups in more detail. Thank you Aaron. When we started with our playgroups, we started with uh, a lot of different equipment, um, but we found we only usually needed a few key pieces. Uh, we used an air horn, which needed to, we needed if we had any fights to break up. We also used a correction spray to de-escalate any behaviour, which is just the pressurised air. Drop leads were always used. Um, that was for if we needed to get dogs out of a situation without putting ourselves in any harm's way. Um, as Aaron mentioned, having people, uh, having key people and the right amount of people at all times is also the key. We, yes, we have had fights, um, but only minor ones. Um, we do have a small clip here that I'd like to show you.
sharing many of these strategies in large organisations like ours with staff and volunteers is always difficult. So trying to capture as many as possible, uh, we've used a few strategies as in after work presentations, uh, using food and drink always helps with that. Um, updating in morning meetings with staff and volunteers and also we've got an intranet which always works. Just like to talk about an upgraded cattery for a moment. Um, we were very aware that we needed to update our facilities, particularly our cattery, to improve not only on our rehoming strategies but our reclaiming ones as well. We revamped our cattery areas, including an isolation ward, a cat assessment room, and also a cat holding room where cats on arrival could go if they were highly stressed. A lot of the cattery upgrades will be used in our full site redevelopment, which will start within the next 12 months. The updated cattery has helped us to explore many treatment options for cats, both medical and behavioural. This, along with the increase of foster cats and kittens returning to us, has given us a challenge of more cats and kittens that needed to be rehomed. So this got us thinking about off-site adoptions. We opened an off-site adoption centre. More recently, we've also partnered with Pet Stock. With our rehoming centre, we adopted over 300 cats and kittens within the first 12 months. Although these numbers are good, the foot traffic hasn't been as high as expected with rent and staffing costs, and also it has been difficult to keep volunteers. It has just been decided this adoption centre will close at the end of the month. But on a positive note, earlier this year, pet stock owners did visit this uh, port adoption centre and we're very impressed with the concept and setup of this. So we've now entered into a partnership with pet stock and they will be adopting our animals through one of their flagship stores. This will also now increase to three stores by the end of the month with more stores to follow. This has been a real success so far with just one store rehoming 80 cats and kittens to date. Some of the other AWL strategies we've done is the connect and protect, manage intake, foster care and adoption follow-ups. This slide is a slide of our connect and protect program in action. Along with a small grant, we started $10 microchipping, connect and protect. With local councils, we travel and hold microchip days. Connect and protect started community chipping April this year. We've so far held four events and microchipped almost 700 animals of all shapes and sizes, including an albino wallaby. When it comes to managed intake, We've done things um, such as help a husband and wife dissect over 12 cats that were around their workshop instead of surrendering them and risking them being euthanized due to them not being able to be handled. And they are more than happy to continue looking after them in that situation. We've done this on quite a few occasions now. We've also performed a few surgeries on people's pets that came to us to surrender them because they couldn't afford vet treatment, thus keeping them out of the shelter. Our foster care program has undergone a total revamp um, because before 2014, our foster program solely relied on our staff, but now has increased to 1,100 animals being put through our foster care system last financial year. All our foster carers go through a weekend training course, home visit and police check. When it comes to adop adoption follow-ups, this has so far only been done on a limited basis due to not having the right staff in place. But this is a strategy we're still looking at improving on and hope to overcome problems in this area. Our adoptions have steadily increased, most noticeably in cats and kittens. The factors behind this have been things such as our new CEO and soon after board changes with a clear focus on empowering staff and volunteers to go forward with ideas and strategies on rehoming pets. 
and a lot of these people here have probably done before. Things like twilight adoptions during summer and school holidays, themed adoption events like on Valentine's Day and Easter, giveaways with adoption animals, toys, vouchers, also the price focus ones, percentage off, low starting prices, fee free adoptions, especially during kitten season for adult cats. One of our biggest changes has been from the 1st of July, across the board, all of our standard adoption prices have significantly gone down, with the exception of puppies and small dogs. We are heading in the right direction, but there's still some work to do. So incoming animals has gone down by 240, rehoming has gone up by, eight, by 984, and our euthanasias have gone down by 1,300. Sorry, 1,370. I'll hand back to Aaron now, who will complete a presentation on a brief on our master plan. Over the next two years, there will be a complete redevelopment of our Wingfield site. Our current mm -hmm. shelter was initially built in 1976 and has been added to over the years. The redevelopment will cover approximately 75% of the buildings on site, including the kennels, clinic, and dog and cat reception areas. The highlights of the redevelopment are its modern design with studied out facilities, a more open site allowing for more green space for animal exercise and enrichment activities, a central customer hub to faci facilitate a more transparent and welcoming experience, a two-story design with a cattery amongst the treetops, and lastly an environmentally and ergonomically sustainable design for animals and people. So in concluding, uh, was any of this easy? No. Do we have lots more to do? Yes. And will we keep improving and learning? Absolutely. Thank you everyone, that concludes our presentation.